So we want to mahalo to all of you for sharing stories and wonderings if some questions came up about your communities. In just a moment, we're going to transition back to the table and we're going to end our, our, our time in this space, this circle rectangle, as it were, uh, in just a moment. Before we head back to our seats, we wanted um, to talk about the title of our presentation, Kuleana, a privilege and a responsibility to land and language. Kuleana is a word we've used uh, in the last few minutes, and it is a word that has a deeper meaning that goes so much further than responsibility. Kuleana means that something is a responsibility, a right, a privilege. For example, I have Kuleana to the land and language of Hawaii. This is a responsibility, but is an immense privilege and honor. And so as we ask you to transition back to your seats, we ask you to reflect on this question, which Rebecca and I will both answer in just a moment. Hey, aha ko kuleana, what is your responsibility? And as you're thinking about that, please transition back to your seats. All right, so we taught you three terms in Hawaiian. I'm gonna teach you an important one that I teach my students. And I'm going to say a word, and you're going to respond with another word, okay? So, when you hear me say eo, you're going to say ea. Got it? It's so easy. Eo. Ea. Eo. Ea. Okay, Maika mahalo. Eo means call out or answer. Ea means here I am. It also means, it also means sovereignty, by the way. Um, so our, I'm going to explain that a little. Our motto in Hawaii is ua mau ke eo ka aina i ka pono. The life of the land is perpetuated in righteousness. Land's important to us in Hawaii. We take it very seriously. It is our kuleana, our right and our privilege. And so um, I'm going to have you take a look at that question that Natalie posed to everybody. Hea hako kuleana. What is your responsibility? Well, my answer to that question was, E ike, ike kayauru, which is to know your community. Well, I shared earlier that, that um, the middle photo was from my hometown of Kaneohe, and there's a big mountain range between Kaneohe and the place that I teach, which is Waipahu. And I've been at Waipahu for over 30 years, and it, I, I don't care from day one till now. When the students here that I come from Kaneohe, they will always comment, Whoa, Kumu, that's so far away. And I think, okay, well, it takes me 25 minutes to drive from my house to school. So even though it's not really physically so far away, it really is far away in their minds. We have a totally different community. And so my kuleana, when I first started many years ago, was to get to know the community that I'll be teaching in. What? is it about like what is about not only the land but the people their families where they come from what are the languages that they speak what's their story man what is waipahu's story um so i'm going to just give you a brief um history lesson about the hometown that um, the town that i teach in in waipahu and what a great place to start what a history lesson that our alma maters may um, hold and so if you notice we're a pretty um, old school and we were established in 1938. And this uh, alma mater was written in 1944. And it highlights a couple of things. It really highlights what was important in the community back in 1938 and 1944, where it says, midst the waving tassel stands by Pahu High. What are those tassels? Fields are rich and fertile where the tall cane grows. Why Pahu and Hawaii? Sugar was king for many, many years, about a century, about a hundred years. Um, sugar reigned in Hawaii as um, just one of the main crops and one of uh, just a, a giant economy of agriculture. And Waipahu was in the hub of sugar cane. When I arrived at Waipahu High School, um, towards the, I'd want to say towards the latter end of sugar, um, there were hundreds of acres still of sugar cane being grown there. And where are we? Well, we're located Makai. Come on, everybody. Where's Makai? Makai. Oh, that. Okay. So we're going from Mauka. We're not. We're, we're not up in the hills. We are Makai. 
we're like right on the ocean and we have a beautiful view like we have an ocean view at our school there are giant ships back there from Pearl Harbor but it's still a beautiful view oh, okay a couple of things before I advance the slide okay number one sugarcane is um, imports it to Waipahu if you notice our logo that's the the um, waving tassels of the sugarcane and our school newspaper is called um, the cane tassel our yearbook is called Kamea Ohi, or the harvester, the gatherer, all paying homage to the agricultural roots of Waipahu. So 100 years of sugarcane. So when I arrived in Waipahu, my first graduating class was 1986. And Waipahu Sugar Mill was a functioning sugar mill. It was one of two functioning sugar mills on the island of Oahu. And functioning meaning that it processed the sugarcane. So if you're not familiar what sugarcane is, it's a tall grass. It's very high. It almost looks like corn. If you weren't familiar with sugarcane, you'd think we'd have corn fields there, but it's sugar. And so what would happen is you would let the, the cane dry. And then when it was very dry, you'd set it on fire and they burn the cane before they harvested it. So they'd tell the schools and the families so there'd be a, um, a posting of when they're gonna do cane burning. And then you'd know so people would not put their laundry out because you'd have like ashes in the sky. And so your, your laundry would get dirty. So um, I remember first teaching at Waipahu and there would just be floating ashes and I'd be like, what is this? Like, that's the sugar cane. That, okay. So that was the cane and they came, the American and European businessmen thought it was a good idea to grow sugar because Hawaiians already had an indigenous plant um, called ko and it's a sugar cane. It was a variety of sugar cane. That's not the cane that they chose to use to grow in the plantations. They chose another variety. Um, they also chose not to use the agricultural practices of the natives, um, which is to switch out and to do more than one crop. They decided to do a monocrop system with one crop, 100 years, taking a toll on the soil. And also, when you do a monocrop system, it, it, does, it does not replenish the nutrients in the system. They didn't allow for that. And um, there are just years and years of chemicals and pesticides that are saturated through, those, um, through the soil. So that was beautiful Waipahu, and it still is beautiful. So tranquil lies Pearl Harbor. Placid in repose. So do you see the star? We are the star. So Waipahu High School, when I say it sits Makai, we are right on the, the edge of Pearl Harbor. And those, um, I'm gonna give you a brief historical walkthrough. 1893, overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy, the American businessmen who had um, strong missionary roots at that time took over the government. 1896, super important to language teachers and just people. The Hawaiian language had been banned from um, the use of the schools. So Hawaiian, Hawaiian was the national language. Everyone spoke Hawaiian. Everyone who was there, they were Japanese, Chinese, Korean, um, American, anything, you, you spoke Hawaiian. Um, there were over 100 newspapers that were printed in Hawaiian. There were two newspapers in Japanese. We were one of the most literate um, countries in the planet. 1908, um, Naval Station Pearl Harbor was established right there, right in our, in our backyard. And then in 1938, in response to just a, the boom of sugar and the military base on that side of the island, it's called the West Side, um, Waipahu High School was established. We were the only school on the West Side. And then in 1941, big happening, you may have heard of it, it's called the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Um, so Pearl Harbor is literally our backyard and it was bombed on Sunday morning at 8.30 in the morning on December 7th. Huge effect on Hawaii. And Hawaii was put into martial law from 1941 to 1944. So 1944, end of martial law. Then 1959, may not be in some of your lifetimes, but it has been in my lifetime. Hawaii becomes the 50th state, okay? So lots of stuff happening focused on the place where I teach. And that is the history that 
my students know. That's the history of their families. Their families are plantation workers. Their families um, um, work on the base. So that was the, the history when I first got there. That's not the history there anymore. There is no um, sugar mill. By Pahu 2023, fast forward. Those sugar plantations, the sugar fields, the thousands of acres have been replaced by housing, by um, just housing development. <clears throat> that sugar mill, we're proud of it. We keep the smokestack up there, and then the YMCA occupies it and we put the fitness center there. But that is still a landmark in Waipahu is our, is our smokestack. Because there's so much development on the west side, no one would, I'm, when I say no one would come to the west side before, I'm not kidding. You were scared to come to the west side. But now we have development, we have, um, we have this new thing, it's called traffic. So, <laughs> so people, the jobs are no longer there, so people don't work on the plantation anymore and very few people work at the naval base. People in Waipahu and in the neighboring towns um, come to town. And so traffic is really horrendous, but I'm not in that traffic. I'm going to show you where I am. Uh, right there. So I'm in the other direction looking at that traffic. And the new thing that just opened um, in July, and it's going to open for the public in a few weeks, we have a raised mass transit rail system. And so we are the hub, we are the middle of that. So there's a lot happening in Waipahu. Okay, so that's the history that everybody knows and that's really the history that is a graduation um, requirement. It's called Modern History of Hawaii that's taught in our schools in either the ninth or the 11th grade in all public schools in Hawaii. So that's the history that all of our students are familiar with. <clears throat> My kuleana is as a native Hawaiian woman and also as the Hawaiian language teacher is to teach the history prior to that. There is a history prior to that. So we had a name for Pearl Harbor and the name of Pearl Harbor is called Pu'uloa. It's the Oidi or the native name. Pearl Har um, Pu'uloa doesn't have a pearl in it and it doesn't talk about a harbor. Pu'uloa means long hill. Um, we also have stories, stories of that rich place of the shark guardians, Ka'ahupahau and Kahi'uka, her brother. And students love the stories of Hawaii. They just eat it up. We also had um, one of the richest um, places where you could find lokoi'a or fish ponds. And fish ponds were really for the royalty and they were sort of like the refrigerator. So, you know, it's hard work going out there fishing every day. So we corralled them and then we used those fish ponds. The fish ponds were not for common people. The fish ponds were for the ali'i, for the chiefs, but the chiefs allowed a little smaller pond off of their main pond. And that's how the other, the kanaka in the community could gather their fishes. And we were Pu'uloa, if you notice, because we're, where we're located, that was the perfect place for Lokoi'a. Okay, and then we have the, our name, Vai. Vai means water, and if you've ever come to Hawaii, I don't know if you've heard this term, it calls Oleika Vai. Um, water is life. And so water is an indication of the wealth of that community. Um, the word for rich or valuable in Hawaiian is tu vai, or Vai Vai. And so if you had Vai in your town, you know, that was a pretty affluent neighborhood. Well, here are the places that we have in our little area in Waipahu, and Waipahu being one of them. Um, Waipio is arching water. Waikele, muddy water. Waipahu, where we're from, or where the school is at, is gushing waters. And then Waimano, meaning many waters. And some of you are really familiar with the place that, um, in Hawaii called Waikiki. Waikiki is spouting water. Okay, I'm gonna go back to, that was my kuleana to land. Like, what do I have to know about the land? So I had to, um, I really did research and I loved it, um, knowing about the stories of um, Pu'uloa, um, knowing about the people and the history pr prior to um, the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy. I'm gonna come back to our school. And what is my kuleana to the language in the school? Taking the same alma mater, um, we have 11 teachers in our 
department, our world languages department. And these are the languages that we teach. We teach Hawaiian, Japanese, Spanish, Samoan, no longer Samoan, um, Ilocano, Korean, and Chinese. And a few years ago, um, one of our just beautiful teachers, um, Prof. Sledge, he's the Spanish teacher, he, he made a challenge to all of us. And at a meeting he said, wouldn't it be fun if we all took our alma mater and put it in our languages? And then, so some of us were like, no, nah, that doesn't sound fun at all. <laughs> but he's like, that would be so much fun, wouldn't it? So um, some of the teachers, we, I put it all in Hawaiian. We, we took the challenge, challenge, check, accepted. And so we turned it into the different languages. And so now we have on file our alma mater in the different languages. And so when we get together as a department for cultural activities, then we'll each take a line and we're gonna, and we teach our students this, the blended alma mater that we sing together. And then we end in English. Uh, <clears throat> but if you just take a look at it and if you really think about it, um, those languages that we teach in our school reflect the community of the language speakers that are in Hawaii. And so you take a look at Hawaiian, all, everyone knew Hawaiian, and, and Hawaiian is really a thriving language now. Um, Japanese, Japanese is very um, popular in Hawaii. We have a lot of Japanese um, families. Japanese, so the, the three immigrant population of plantation workers, the three strongest were Japanese, Chinese, and Korean. And so those three plantation workers came to Waipahu, started in Waipahu, and left Waipahu to be prosperous other places. So those are the three strong languages or were in our community, and we teach that now. Spanish is very popular, um, but not maybe not um, from Spain. So the song that we open with is called Navaqueros. And so um, <clears throat> the vaqueros were asked to come to Hawaii because um, to help the Hawaiian men. So we had vaqueros come from Mexico and they helped our Hawaiian men do two things, help us to corral the feral cows that were once a gift to the king. They went crazy. And so the vaqueros helped to corral them and ranch. So they taught them ranching skills um, and how to make saddles. Okay, so that's the Spanish influence. Samoans um, were, right after because of the, the naval influence, so the military um, opened up. Samoans have come for, um, they built the Mormon um, temple in La Ie and put down roots in La Ie and have come for military. And then the final, um, well, the latest population of people to work on the plantation are the Filipino. And that is a super, super strong community um, that we have at Waipahu. 66% of the students um, identify as either Filipino or part Filipino in our school. And the next highest um, ethnicity are Hawaiian at 10%. So we've been talking a lot about Hawaii, and so where in the world is it? It is the most isolated island chain in the world, and it is enlarged on this map because if it were its true size, you wouldn't actually be able to see it, this map were to scale. Um, and I chose this map, and I've used it in other presentations, uh, for that purpose, but also because it centers Hawaii, which is unusual. Most maps center Western Europe, which centers Western Europe, both physically, but also culturally, linguistically, and racially. Sorry, I need to move this down because I am much shorter. Um, I had not thought about how maps tell stories and uphold systems of oppression and privilege when I was growing up. I am honored to call Hawaii home now, but I am neither Kanaka Maoli, a native person of the land, nor was I born and raised there. I was born and raised in the Chicago suburbs. It is an honor to be here speaking with you this morning about the concept of Kuleana as a white woman born and raised in the Midwest, but it is also potentially out of place and problematic. So today, in this moment, I will talk about what I believe my kuleana is to land in language in a place that I am not from. And I'm gonna tell a quick story to center that. So I got to travel to Canada and visit some schools and I got to visit an outdoor education center um, and engage with uh, the people who were running this school. Um, and they were telling us about their program and what they do with the students and they were very passionate, enthusiastic. And so 
I asked the question, how does your work in outdoor education incorporate indigenous knowledge or ways of knowing? And this seemed a natural question to ask, especially in an outdoor education center. Um, and our host seemed ready for my question and replied, it is not my place as a colonizer to share indigenous knowledge. And we moved on and we never came back to the question. So this poster here, the First People's Principles of Learning, has some very important points on it. And if you want to find it, you just search that title and you can find it on Google for yourself. Um, in case you cannot read it, the last bullet point down there says, learning involves recognizing that some knowledge is sacred and only share with permission and or in certain situations. I think we can all nod and we can say, yes, that sounds right. But I was not asking the presenter to share sacred knowledge, but perhaps to share the names of that place in the language of the First Peoples. I would argue that to come to the conclusion that by being white, not from this place, or a colonizer as a reason for not engaging with or appropriately sharing knowledge that is freely available to outsiders is an abdication of responsibility. By abdicating responsibility because we are not of a place originally ensures further erasure and solidifies the hold that white Western dominant ways of being hold on communities and students. There is an Olelo no Eau, a Hawaiian proverb that um, I really appreciate. And then Olelo no Eau, maybe that's one of your 10 words, I don't know, you'll remember later, um, is a Hawaiian proverb and usually has a deeper meaning. Ho'okahi no la okamalihini, and it translates to a stranger only for a day. And the deeper meaning is after the first day as a guest, one must help with the work. As a white teacher from the mainland in Hawaii, I have often asked myself, it is, is it my place or it's appropriate to incorporate Hawaiian cu uh, culture into my work with students because I am not of this place, nor am I of indigenous ancestry. In fact, I am the same ancestry that colonized and devastated this land. I believe that I am no longer a guest. And so it is my responsibility to help with the work of honoring land and, land and language. It is my responsibility to tap into what my community offers to Malahini teachers, Malahini, right, being strangers. Um, and that is the work of my community. The work of the community is what your community needs and what your community is asking for. And that work is gonna be different state to state, city to city, school to school. And when we think about the work in Hawaii, what is my community asking me to do? There is this beautiful quote by our, one of our complex area superintendents, Suzanne Mukehi. She said, when I walk into a Hawaii public school, I want to close my eyes and know that I am in a school in Hawaii and not somewhere else. He aha ko kuleana, the question we asked, what is your responsibility? It is vital that what has been taught to me and what I've been given permission to share finds its way into my lessons, into how I run a classroom and how I evaluate and reflect on my own work if I am to honor this special place and help with the work of ensuring that when you walk into a classroom in Hawaii, you know you are in Hawaii and not just any classroom on the mainland. I am not complex area su superintendent uh, Mukehi, but I'm guessing that she wasn't thinking that only classrooms with native Hawaiian teachers would be a part of this. This is the work of all of this, and it is what my community is asking me to engage with. Conferences are held across Hawaii to help educators like myself to grow in their understanding of local frameworks and history and culture. The oli that we offered at the beginning were taught to me, and then we are asked to take them back to our classrooms. The work of your community might be different, but this is the work of mine. So where am I thinking about honoring my Kuleana de Lanin language? I teach on the west side of Hawaii Island, that's where that, that star is. We, um, and Ho uh, the big island is what you might know it as, but it's actually called Hawaii Island. And it is, I teach in the town of Kailua Kona. Hawaii Island is the youngest of all of the islands, and it is still being actively created today by five volcanoes. And you may have heard of the youngest of these five volcanoes, Kilauea. Kilauea is on the news because it is active, right? You might have also heard of Mauna Loa, the second youngest volcano, uh, which was also on the news for being active this past year. And then I teach on the slopes of Hualalai, the middle volcano, the third youngest and the third oldest. And then Mauna Kea and then Kohala as the eldest volcano. 
But let's zoom in even further and think about exactly where Kealakehe High School is. The islands are divided into small sections, and these sections are called Ahupua'a. It is a land division that goes from Mauka, mm -hmm. Mauka. Mauka to Makai. Makai. These were used by Hawaiians to manage land to ensure balance in the agriculture and ecosystem. Kealakehe High School is in the Ahupua'a called Kealakehe. I did not understand land like this while I was growing up in the suburbs of Chicago, and that is all the more reason why it's important for me to learn about this. It is my kuleana, my responsibility and privilege to seek out information that I do not know, whether that's through reading, taking classes, or actually getting out on the land for service learning. And this map here is actually something I can easily use in my classroom. Most of us are familiar with the strategy called picture talk. And we can, with permission, use images and maps of our communities that ground our students in a local context and understanding while also helping them grow in their language skills. It is my kuleana to learn about this and bring it in my classroom. And I want to be clear that I'm not suggesting I, I in, am accessing or imparting knowledge that's not mine to share, but that I'm using resources already created by my community. OK, one more map. I'm really into maps. Um, Hawaii, which as we can see from this map, is part of Polynesia. Find the star. Um, and you may see many different versions of this map where the different countries are grouped into different regions. The different versions of this map all have weight and importance, especially when we consider that oftentimes the grouping of countries or people into regions is not done with the consent or guidance of the people who are actually being grouped. I want to name that this is not the best nor the most accurate map, and I don't want to say it's a good enough map because there's no map that is agnostic of an impact. I'm sharing this map so that we can further locate Hawaii in the world, but also to show where a large number of our students or their parents call home. Many of my students are from Micronesia, specifically the Marshall Islands or the Federated States of Micronesia. And when I think about my kuleana to land and language, this does not just mean olelo Hawaii, Hawaiian language. I have a kuleana to all of the languages that my students speak. And so I want to talk about a program at our school very briefly. The students of my community speak a wide range of languages. They speak Hawaiian, Marshallese, Spanish, Tagalog, Ilocano, Japanese, Korean, Koshrayan, Chukis, and many more. In fact, at least 30% of Hawaii County, which is the big island of Hawaii, speaks a language of other than English at home. This means that many people are left out because we are not communicating with them, because we're only communicating in English as a school. But our students who see and engage with the world in multiple languages every day can help us create a more welcome community while also elevating the power of multilingualism. On the west side of Hawaii Island, three schools are banding together to try to grow a community of translators, all while students get dual high school and college credit and a possible paid internship experience. This program, which I founded a few years ago in partnership with the University of Hawaii Hilo, is called Transformative Translation, and it seeks to train students to translate communication from English to the many languages of our community while offering them college credit and a paid internship experience. How much time do we uh, this program is moving into its third pilot year, and it has expanded to include students from, as I said, three different high schools, and now two sections of the course. If you've ever piloted a program, you know that you get so excited, and you're like, woo, we grew. Yes, so exciting. Um, and it is one of the ways that I hope to honor my responsibility to the languages of my community. My kuleana, my responsibility, and immense privilege in this work is that I am going, I'm helping to create paths alongside other people in my community for students to do this work. And then I get out of the way and we see what they do. And the last thing I will reflect on is a resource we have in our community that also talks about language, but it also talks about land. So as a Malahini educator, I have a kuleana to both land and language to seek out resources created by the people of my community that were intended for our use in schools. In Hawaii, we are very lucky because we have a beautiful resource called the Naho Pena'a'o, or the Ha Framework. This was created by leaders in our community uh, for all teachers and students to use, regardless of their origin. I use this resource, which talks about six different 
uh, important outcomes, as you can see up there, to help my students collectively create norms for our classroom at the start of the year and to use during our weekly community meetings, which we call family time, which are always in circle. We use this framework to reflect on our week and well-being and anchor ourselves in the values of our community. And as I said, the work of my community is to know that you are in a classroom in Hawaii when you, are, when you walk in the room. And so Hawaii has hosted conferences to help all educators learn how to use this in our classrooms. I am no longer a stranger, I'm no longer a guest, and it's my responsibility to bring this back into my classroom after learning about it in those, class, in those contexts. Okay, mahalo, Natalie. <clears throat> so just to honor time, I'm going to skip ahead and I'm going to share with you. Let's see. I'm going to share just a 30 second commercial. Ahapunanaleo <clears throat> is, a, is a, a language nest. And so I told you that the, the um, language was taken out of the school system. Well, we thought it would be befitting to, um, in order for us to reclaim our language, our language that was really toward, going towards extinction with 2,400 native speakers, all elders, um, and they would, and that would be the passing of our language. That was unacceptable to a very small group of active um, college students about 40 years ago. They said, this can't happen. So the first thing they did is they went into the political realm and they changed the law. So Hawaiian is now one of the two state languages, the official languages, Hawaiian and English. And because of that, we're able to go back into the schools and put our Hawaiian programs back into the schools. So there are 22 Hawaiian medium um, immersion schools. And so that 2,400 are now up to close to 325,000 native speakers and, and growing and it's, it's an exciting time. And I wanna show, um, before you get back into the circle that I know that you're looking forward to, um, I wanna show a tiny little commercial that comes out of Ahapunanaleo Preschool, um, the founders of this movement. Yep, it's just not the same. If you call spouting water, which all is Waikiki. Yep, so we're gonna end in circle. We're going to ask you all to turn to that person you began speaking with and answer this question for yourself. Hey, aha ko kuliana, what is your responsibility? Because that's going to be different for every community. So if you are next to that same person, please go ahead and turn to them and answer this question. If you're not, make a new friend. All right, let's test that TPR. Can I see Malka? Malka? Yes, Malka? Oh, okay, mahalo. Okay, um, thank you all for sharing and grounding in the stories of your communities. And we would like to now close. Yes. Yes, we would. Okay. We are going to close with one more oli, and maybe that's one of your words you might know as we leave here. Uh, and we are going to close with ol oli nope. mahalo. Okay. You can see the English translation over there. <laughs> And you <laughs> That's on Kilauea on the volcano. Oh, oh yeah, we took yeah. that when we were working on this together. Uhola ia kamakaloa la. Hu ai ke aloha la. Hu ka i ia kahaloa la. Pa ve hi mai na lehua. Mai ka ho o kuia ka hala vaila, mahalo e na akua, mahalo e na kapuna la ea, mahalo me ke alohala, mahalo me ke alohala, mahalo, mahalo. mahalo.